houses and start planting bombs <coughs> on planes just for jolly, wouldn't you, after reading all about it? They know it's the thing to do. And every device intercepted increases the terror. Then you hit trains and ships, buses and subways inside the city. You make truck driving the most dangerous profession with special attention to food trucks. Then you can hit the power stations and water reservoirs. Chemical and biological weapons. For random terror attacks, gas bombs are often more effective than explosives. They are also cheaper and easier to make. A container of sulfuric acid concealed in package or briefcase. You press down a plunger which drops sodium cyanide into the acid and leave your package in the subway at the rush hour or in a theater, a political rally, or revival meeting. Chemical and biological weapons can be made in the basement lab if you know how. In The Wild Boys, my next novel, I propose to transfer desirable species of plants, animals, fish, and birds from pleasant distribution to other areas uh, where conditions are sufficiently similar to ensure growth and reproduction. Look at the map and always remember your subjects may be more adaptable than you realize. Consider the walleye pike, which is not a pike, the species of perch and undoubtedly one of the greatest freshwater panfish. Found in the lakes and rivers of Minnesota and Canada and in clear cold streams down into Missouri and Arkansas. And consider the smallmouth black bass of similar distribution. Both species will live in cold water anywhere. They would thrive in the lakes and rivers of England and Scotland and Northern Europe, to the best of my knowledge, no one has bothered to import fingerlings. The large mountain black bass tolerates quite his power will never Winston by making him starve. He thinks it's not enough. How can he be sure he's obeying your will and not his own? Power is inflicting pain and humiliation. The world which will grow not less but more merciless as it defines itself. There will be no motions except fear, rage, triumph, and self abasement. Anything else which should destroy your sex instinct be eradicated. Should punish your orgasm. The thrill of victory and the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. That's all we mean to In your case, the worst thing in the world happens to be your rats. First, it's only you with the cake. Okay, I'll answer that briefly again. There's a body slug in meeting with control of the past. Repeat it, please. Who controls calling partisans of all nations? Shut the numbers. Doorways, uh, word lines, vocal falling, word falling. Enemy is fired. We attack. Towers open fire. Interviews with me by Terry Wilson. I am, intend to read some pages on subjects which came very close to us and I think are, uh, most of us here are aware of the fact that um, one can be generous, one can give things to people, and sometimes this is called teaching. So Terry's question was, how much can somebody really give to anyone else? And I said, not much, not all that much. I have a very amusing thing that William remembered. It amused me that he remembered it in the last edition of the last words of Dutch Schultz, saying, oh, or is it in Sideswiping? What is the name of that book, that photo book that was so great? Sideswiping. corrects me and says, that was side tripping, was photographed by Charles Gatewood. Side tripping. Text by William Burroughs. I said, yeah, sideswiping. Hmm. It says... This was the uh, dedication for Brown, who said that uh, 
he could not show somebody anything that they hadn't seen already. Well, the same thing seems to me true about any kind of teaching. I mean, nobody can give you the keys unless you know what a key looks like. And it doesn't necessarily look, as Korzybski said about a chair, this is anything you like in the world except a chair, that is the word chair. Well, it's the same thing about a key, except teaching anything is anything you like except what you expect it to be. And if you think it is something, your thought has been molded by that form and you cannot therefore really, you say, I am a lock, put in your key and turn me over. Well, turn the boys over is one way of teaching. It's one way of doing it. In fact, a great deal of oriental knowledge has been passed on that way. A great deal of mystical knowledge. A great deal of Sufi discipline has occurred within that area. And uh, there has been teaching, uh, giving, passing from a teacher to an adept by the method of turn the boy over. Now, there must be other ways. There are other ways. There may even be better ways. Uh, and at that time, I was immediately complaining about these machines that were working with that weren't working very well. In fact, this microphone here doesn't seem to be working as well as the other one. Right now. Anyhow, I said, um, this sort of knowledge cannot simply be handed over to anyone who comes in and says, give me the keys. He comes in, uh, he's wiser, and um, tries to seduce his teacher. There are teachers who are beyond seduction, of course. We all know or have heard of some. And Terry says, you mean, in other words, that the knowledge is stolen? And I said, yes, essentially. I have been told by people who claim to be great masters, uh, when I asked them how they got this knowledge, they said, why, I stole it, of course. So let's say rather than stolen, which I think is true, I wouldn't deny that, but this knowledge is exchanged in a, exchanged in a relationship of love, rather. The way a disciple can fall in love with his guru. The way some of our American friends have fallen in love with their Tibetan gurus, who are certainly worthy of love, very charming old gentlemen. Uh, but... Um, uh, not necessarily anything sexual about their relationships. I'm not suggesting that for a second. Um, whereas in many of the Oriental sects, uh, this has definitely been a case of uh, knowledge passed from the master to a disciple by the actual act of love. Uh, one of the most famous examples being Rumi, who, if one reads his uh, extraordinary fascination for uh, Shamsuddin Tabrizi, one realizes that this was indeed a very, very great love story. And in some of these other cases of history, this has been true as well. That is, nobody can really rush in out of the supermarket and want to get the keys into the condominium saying, give me the keys, give me the keys. So Terry suggested at this point, but I remember what I had written myself about an experience that I'd had traveling in the Sahara mm, 20 years ago, something like that. And I turned this into fiction, of course, but it's very like a, an event that actually occurred in my experience. And uh, I wrote, I refilled my pipe with my excellent key from Katama to send it passing around the reformed circle on the map. I told youngest brother that I had come from further across the great wastes of the world than he. From beyond a great river of salt, called the Atlantic, which runs away in the sands to the west. For the river, I quote, hath more need of the fountain than the fountain hath need of the river. I am that river, running away on your Afric shore, where from your lips tonight, dear brother, I have heard the fountain well up bubbling up from the great fossil underground river 
for the blind pro crocodile of our master, Hassan Isabo, old man of the mountain and the great sandy wastes, has lurked for centuries in the darkness. Youngest brother nodded eagerly. Yes, he said, and one day he will break forth and devour our enemy, the sun. This seemed to me a fine example of miscomprehension, after all. Who would devour our enemy? Is the sun our enemy, first of all? And I said, ah, oh, so he will indeed. Mr. Ugly Spirit himself, disguised as a hydrohelium bomb, perhaps. Yet, oh, the strange relaxation of it. I alone, of all these assassins, have ever been foolish enough to conceive of happiness. The staggering assumptions in my young companion's calm eyes would make my white American compatriots collapse with a whimper or go running for the police. There is no friendship. There is no love. The desert knows only allies and accomplices. The heart here is all in the very moment. Everything is bump and flow, meet and goodbye. Only the Brotherhood of Assassins assures ritual continuity, if that is what you want. And some do. And that lesson of our zikr, the lesson our zikr teaches is, there are no brothers. Terry was rather horrified by this. And he said, he was, I'm questioning that phrase, there are no brothers. And I said, there are no brothers because everyone is always alone. There can be brotherhoods in which one meets, eats, sleeps, smokes together. But essentially, each person's adventure in life is a singular one. That's also what all these Huxley one said. One is born at a certain moment. Island and universes. At another, one dies, and the breathing that one does from here to there is done alone and on one's own. Terry said, that magician you mentioned in the process who you found eating his own shit, you said that a man must needs make himself truly impure to be free, to free himself from the constrictions of the law which keep the rest of society from magic? And I said, well, the idea of law is that everyone remains pure within the law. And a criminal or a magician can only be an outsider and a criminal and must be outside the law in order to operate or his function would be within the domains of the law and therefore regulated by the law itself. What he claims is that he has an altogether different dispensation, another and different one. He says, better, more expensive, more effective, whatever you like, but another one in any case, outside the law. In fact, magic, like art, is outside the law. Terry said, that statement makes me think of Genet. And I too think of him tonight because the night before last, somebody gave me very serious news of Genet saying that he had simply picked up what he could carry and he had made off and one didn't know where he'd gone. He's always been a very secret man but there has always been somebody who knew where he was, and now it is said that nobody knows where he is. So the rest of this is a bit of a homage to Jean oh, Genet. That's the first fucking layer. And I said, oh, Genet, 